I told you last week, as we go through Philemon, because of the subject matter, I'm going to have to go digging for gold. And when I see a statement that I think I, that not, the statement not so much about what Paul's writing, but it gives me something to bring home to you that makes it worth our while to go through. For example, last week, um, the gold I found was when he told him that, um, in essence, loving Jesus, loving the saints, is what uh, he said, uh, I thank God making mention of you in my prayers, um, hearing of thy faith in verse 5, which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints. So we, uh, that's a common, and, and you'll see all those references in Romans and 1 Corinthians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians, 2 Timothy. They're all epistles that Paul wrote where in the first few verses he says something very similar to this. He's always happy when he hears of the people he's writing to when their love for God, their faith in God, their love for God, and their love for one another gets all the way back to wherever Paul is. He is thrilled to hear that Christians are loving God and loving people. So we centered on that for a while last week. Even though that's just a common introduction with Paul, it helped us find a little gold we could build on for a bit last week. Now this week, we also found a little gold. As we get into this week's lesson, the title will be, A Christian Should Always Strive to Do What's Right. So in what he's encouraging Philemon to do here shortly, I thought there's a little gold we can build on for a little bit tonight. So, uh, just telling you the story of a runaway slave getting saved in prison, Paul encouraging him to go back to his owner and carry the letter uh, of uh, commendation that he wrote of Onesimus to give to his owner. And again, we have no way of knowing how Philemon responds to his runaway slave coming home. Of course, in Rome, uh, in the Roman Empire, Slaves were property. If they run away, you could kill them, just like you could in early America. Uh, they had no rights. If uh, they run away, you can gun them down. Nobody, they're your property, so nobody could bring charges against you for it in early America. And that's kind of the way it was in Rome. So when Paul leads a man to Christ and said, here's what you got to do now, you can imagine the big gulp in his throat. The Lyman could kill me. Paul said, I, I trust that won't happen. I'm going to write a letter. You record the words for me. And we're going to encourage Philemon to act according to how a Christian should act. So, what we talked about last week, the introduction. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. The only epistle he ever starts with that phrase. A prisoner of Jesus Christ. And he mentions it again in this week's lesson. So twice in his first nine verses, Paul calls himself a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Now, he doesn't mean that I'm locked up for uh, Jesus in the sense that I've given my all to him. He's talking about he's literally a prisoner because of his relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, he says that in the introduction. He He says that to none of the other churches. And he repeats it as he gets to Uh, where he's addressing Philemon more intimately, at friend to friend. He'll repeat that phrase, that I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. So, But anyway, so he identifies himself that way, uh, and and, uh, after uh, greeting Philemon, he also said into our our beloved Aphia, uh, the commentators mostly think that's uh, Philemon's wife, Archippus, their child. Again, I'm not sure we can be 100% certain of that. I think there's a lot of guessing here because he just names these people. Um, Aphib, uh, the, the Greek name, Aphib, uh, Aphia, brother, is a feminine name. That they know, that those who study uh, biblical Greek. So they're pretty sure that's a female, and if he's writing Philemon and not a church, it makes sense to suspect that that female is his wife. Uh, so... 
And then they go from there to assume that Archippus is the son of Philemon and uh, Aphia. Don't you like that name, Aphia? You don't? Loving it. All right. Verse 3. Another part that's very common for Paul. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He not only opens all letters with some form of that greeting in the first few verses, all but one of his epistles, if I remember right, I did a check in the last chapter of his epistles as he's closing out, he always wishes peace and grace uh, to his readers. And I don't mean wishing the way you and I wish upon a star, a fallen star or something. I mean... Uh, that's what he's expressing his desire for the people he's writing to that they would walk in the peace of God and in the grace of God so verse 4 last week I thank my God making mention of the always in my prayers and um, and we mention because of your love toward the saints and uh, our Jesus rather and toward all saints and so we mentioned that uh, we, we got into some things in the upper room when Jesus, in my mind, changed the order of everything. Because remember, in Hebrews there, the author of Hebrews, who most suppose it's Paul, nobody is 100% certain, but most commentators in the evangelical world lean toward it being Paul. And... Uh, Whoever wrote Hebrews mentioned something. I, he said, Jesus, he, he quotes from the book of Psalms where David said there would be a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek, up until David mentions him in a psalm, only appeared one other time in the Scripture. Way back in Abraham's day, when Lot... When the, the three kings in the Sodom and Gomorrah area before they were destroyed were overcome by seven kings and their people taken prisoner and all their possessions, Abraham hears about it. Abraham is a shepherd and he has a bunch of shepherds working for him. I think a hundred and some. And uh, all these shepherds get wind of what happened to the three kings of one of Sodom, one of Gomorrah, and one other country, being overcome by seven kings. And Abraham looks at his shepherds and says, Come on, boys, let's go rescue them. These are shepherds taking care of animals. They're not soldiers. But Abraham was one of those guys who prayed. And he had a good reason not to worry. God had said, You and Sarah are going to have a baby. That baby hadn't been born yet. So unless God's a liar, ain't nobody can kill him. That's like when the um, Samuel, the prophet, goes to Jesse's house to anoint a new king because Saul had disobeyed God. King Saul had disobeyed God. And the prophet said, God's going to take the kingdom away from you. He goes to Jesse's house who has six older brothers. I think there's a total of seven. He either, he either had six older brothers or seven older brothers. I haven't uh, looked it up lately. But I think he, there was seven total. He had six older brothers, and he was a small one, a teenager, the youngest one. And he shows up at Jesse's house. This prophet say, God has sent me to anoint one of your sons to be the next king of Israel. You can imagine how dad gets all happy. So he brings in the oldest. He said, no, not him. Second oldest, not him. He didn't even call David in. David's a teenager watching the sheep out back. The last one dad would expect. The first six come and go. And so finally he said, well, i got one more kid out there watching the sheep. He said, bring him in. And Samuel said, that's the guy. He's going to be the next king of Israel. David had nothing to fear when he faced Goliath. Because God told him through the prophet, you're going to be the next king. He was not a king yet, which meant he could 
not die yet. You following me? And that's the way with um, a lot of these things we read. People have faith because they have a promise that's not fulfilled yet. And they know nothing can change that. But anyway, so David mentioned uh, in, a, in a psalm that this Melchizedek, he was a priest in Abraham's day that when Abraham returned from the battle against the seven kings, having rescued Sodom and Gomorrah and all of them, and Lot, and his, who was Abraham's nephew and his family, and retrieving all of their worldly goods. The three kings said, keep all of the prophets there for what you did. And Abraham said, no, 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 I'll never let you tell anybody you made me rich. All I want is 10% of it. So the kings dished out 10% of everything that they had recovered. And he found this priest named Melchizedek and paid tithes to him. I believe that's the first mention of tithes referring to money in the Bible. So Abraham pays tithes to him. That's all you read. We say this guy, the Old Testament says he has... Uh, no beginning, no ending. But commentators say that just means nobody had really heard of him before. He, he wasn't famous. Others say, no, no, that means he's the pre-incarnate Christ. He stepped out of heaven uh, as a priest. Uh, I tend to believe it just means nobody had heard of him. Uh, he just showed up. So David later is writing a psalm and said, hmm, God showed me we're going to have another priest after the order of Melchizedek. So the author of Hebrews is saying, why would David say that? He was saying that in the spirit of prophecy. Now, if we need another priest after the order of Melchizedek, after all these hundreds and thousands of, I think from Moses to Jesus was about 2,000 years, of the Levitical priesthood, he said, if David's prophesying we need another priest after the order of Melchizedek, God is saying the Levitical priesthood isn't working out. So Jesus, in Hebrews, is being pointed at is the one as the one who's going to be the high priest after the order of Melchizedek. But he's got a problem. He can't be under the law of Moses. Under the law of Moses, you had to be a Levite. He wasn't. You had to be in the family of Levite, a direct descendant of Aaron. He wasn't. He was disqualified. If Jesus had died and come back and claimed to be our high priest, he'd be a lawbreaker. So Hebrews says, where there's the changing of a priesthood, it makes it necessary to change the law. I believe that's what happened on the night he was betrayed when he said, a new commandment I give unto you. I don't believe he was rewording the second greatest commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. I believe he was setting up a new order of how things would be governed. He said, his new commandment is, I want you to love one another the way I love you. By this shall all the world know that you're my disciple. And uh, anyway, so we are now living under what James calls the royal law. This idea of loving and um, one another. And especially the household of faith, Christian loving Christian. We're to do good to all the world, but especially the household of faith, the Bible says. Because by this, our testimony uh, travels among the ungodly. They see there's something real going on there. So, Jesus changed everything that night. It's all about you and me loving Jesus and loving the saints. Now this week, starting with verse 6, a Christian should always strive to do what's right. That the communication of thy faith Verse 5 again, so you can keep this in context of the, of the structure of how Paul is writing this. Verse 5 of last week. Hearing of thy faith and love which thou hast toward the Lord Jesus and toward all saints. Then this one. That the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. I thought, okay, let's put down a couple more modern translations. The Good News Bible words it this way. My prayer is that our fellowship with you as believers will bring about a deeper understanding of every blessing which we have in our life in union with Christ. 
But I was really fascinated. There were three or four of the translations that kind of went along with the NIV. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Now, I put down notes there. Barnes said the phrase translated communion of thy faith means the making of thy faith common to others. That's why uh, communication, um, kianosis, no, not kianosis, that's the other word. Uh, oh, the one crystal always said that, uh, that refers to uh, the communion of believers. I can't think of it right now. I didn't write it down. But anyway, there's a Greek word, and that's what this uh, word means here. That's the word rendered communication, the fellowship of believers, that um, the communication of thy faith. So, when you look at the good news in the NIV, there's different things it could mean. Um, the phrase translated according to Barnes, communication of the faith, means the making of thy faith common to others. There's a communion. Communication is the communion of believers um, through good deeds, as Barnes said, sharing their faith with other believers. So, Again, when you look at the NIV, uh, it could mean either being good to your fellow Christians or sharing your faith with unbelievers through your good deeds or through your witnessing to them. Paul was a great evangelist. Um, part of me would like to lean toward number two, but when you read all the commentators, they seem to lean toward number one. As a good Christian, you should be, in because of the subject of this epistle, I understand their point. As a good Christian, in fellowship with other believers, you should be communicating good things to them through your good deeds, which uh, also uh, can mean, um, you know, as we were in, in uh, Third John on Sunday, uh, the idea of sending traveling preachers on the way with offerings to get them to the next town and so forth. Communicating through your money or through your deeds Onto other believers seems to be the idea there. So, but what he's saying, let's flip this over. Uh, what he's saying in the context would indicate, uh, I mentioned the first probably to be right, but what's another benefit of doing this? Communicating our love toward the Christians through our good deeds and our substances. What's another benefit? Paul is writing here we will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. In other words, we will benefit from our spiritual growth when we communicate Christian love to one another as believers. Now, why is Paul building on all this? We won't get much to it tonight, but next, next Wednesday, Lord willing, we will. Sometimes a good preacher has to set people up. You're about to ask them something. And you got to get them to that point, you think, with the direction of the Holy Spirit, well, they're going to go, yeah, yeah. So you get them doing this toward the, before you ever get to the question. You get them going, yeah, that's right. Oh, that, uh, uh, like usual, Paul, you're right. Uh-huh, uh-huh. So you get them in the habit of nodding their head. So when he gets to the big question, and again, we don't know how he responded to the big question. We don't have any letters back from Philemon to Paul. So, um, but Paul's setting him up, desiring to get the right answer. Now, verse 7, for, on the second side, page 3. For we have great joy and, cons and consolation in thy love, because the bowels of the saints are refreshed by these, brother. By thee, brother. Now, in America, when we talk about bowels, it's not a pleasant subject. So let's look at the, a more modern translation here. The Bible uses phrases like, in the King James, the bowels of thy compassion, uh, things of that nature. Good News Bible renders verse 7 this way. Your love, dear brother, has brought me great joy and much encouragement. You have shared the hearts of all God's people. Isn't that easy to understand? Um, we just don't, unless we're reading Bible verses and repeating, 
we just don't talk that way. Bowels of compassion. Uh, but remember, this was the, the King James Bible came out in 1611 in England. 1611. Somewhere around the time of Shakespeare. How many ever read any Shakespearean books? Or ever seen movies based on something Shakespeare wrote? Um, you'll see. Shakespeare talked that way because he was alive at the time the Bible was being translated into English. We call it, the, it was the King James of England who wanted it done. He got the translators there and ordered it done, and that's why we call it the King James Bible. We don't talk that way. I have never, outside of talking about Scripture, I have never asked anybody, are the bounds of your compassion working well? I've asked similar questions, but never that one. Anyway, uh, you get the idea. So, Paul is saying, it gives me great joy when you are cheering the hearts of God's people. In essence, when you look at the King James beginning and then look at the ending of that verse in the King, uh, Good News Bible. So what might confuse us about what Paul is saying here? I have great consolation in thy love. He's saying it about to a slave owner. He's saying, I am consoled with how much you love people. He is saying that to a slave owner. There is so much we don't know. It's hard to evaluate this letter totally. Was Onesimus his only slave? Was he a rich man that had lots of slaves? How did he treat Onesimus when he was there? If he has more slaves, how was he treating them? Because I'm going to tell you, I don't care what era you were brought up in. If you were brought up to think that owning people was normal, as a Christian, you'd still have the duty of treating that person with love and respect. If you don't treat them with love and respect, your love isn't going to console me at all. If you're beating them every time they're a little slow to obey your orders, I'm not consoled by your love. Now, obviously, if I'm writing to you to encourage you to take a certain action toward this runaway slave that I'm sending back to you, I'm not going to start pointing my finger in your face, getting you mad at me before I get to the question. So I'm going to try to butter your bread. Is that an expression? Sure. It is now. I'm going to try... <laughs> I'm going to try to butter your bread and get you all ready um, to pretty much say yes to anything I asked you. So uh, it could be as simple as that. So he's saying, um, or rather the next question, why do you suppose Paul is writing these things, like verse 7 here? Evidently, Philemon showed great love through acts of Christian charity for the Christian community. Paul will use that fact to steer Philemon to where Paul wants him to go. You see where he's going with this? You have a reputation. You're so good to God's people. So he's going to get to the point in the letter where he says, guess who one of God's people is? Onesimus. You see how he's steering them along a path here, saying, hey, you don't want to spoil that testimony about how good you are to God's people. Well, I, Paul, personally led this guy to Christ. He's one of us. So, he's tried to, trying to be crafty while he records the words that the Holy Spirit are giving him, or maybe I should say the Holy Spirit is giving him the wisdom of craftiness. Um, but he's trying to steer him to where he wants him to go. Verse 8, Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee uh, that which is convenient. Anybody understand that verse in the King James? 
Wherefore, though I might be much bold in Christ to enjoin thee that which is convenient. Now, this will make a little more sense to you, the New Living Translation. That is why I am bolding, boldly asking a favor of you. Now, listen to what he says after that in the New Living Translation. I could demand it in the name of Christ because it is the right thing for you to do. He said, I'm asking. I don't have to ask. We, all of us have been around preachers. None of us have been around a New Testament apostle. I word it that way because in some of the African American churches and even Brother Fogelman in a white church uh, referred to himself as Apostle Fogelman. And uh, black pastors, some of them are referred to themselves as Apostle so-and-so. And, you know, Ephesians 4 says he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. If you want to call yourself an apostle, I'm not going to argue with you. But you're not a first century apostle. The first century apostles were given the responsibility of writing the New Testament, of steering the early church into the directions of New Testament doctrine. You and I have never meant that kind of an apostle. I'm going to tell you something about that kind of apostle. You ain't killing them till God's done with them. They stoned Paul in one city. They drug him out of the city because he was preaching Christ. They drug him out of the city limits and stoned him. And the King James said, left him for dead. Doesn't tell us if he was really dead or not, but it said they left him for dead. His fellow Christian formed a circle around him and prayed for him. And he got back up. Now, I'm going to tell you something. If you've been stoned severely enough where they think you're dead, I don't care if you've never died. You ain't just getting hopping back up. You're in pain. And you know what Paul did? He went right back in the city that they just drug him out of and stoned him in. If it's not these apostles, if it wasn't God's time for them to go, ain't nobody killing them. Now, we can say that about anybody. Uh, you know, God's already got it recorded when we all die. He's seen everything since uh, eternity backwards. He knows the day, the hour, the minute, the second I'm going to die. Or if I'm going to die. Could be around when Jesus descends with a shout. I'd prefer that, but I'm not the one who gets to determine that. But God knows everything. And until he's good and done with me, can I be honest with you? If I was God, I'd have been good and done with me a long time ago. But so, but yeah. <laughs> uh, but let's get back to this, all, because I want you to get the uh, the point. Nobody can kill us till God is done with it. If they can kill me, God doesn't need me here anymore. Pure and simple. Lots of Christians have been martyred, died at the hands of murderers. But they were only able to kill them because God had allowed them to live long enough to do what he wanted them to do. And so Paul is speaking with the authority of an apostle. He said, I'm going to ask you something in a moment. And you know what? I don't even need to ask. I could command you in Jesus' name. Because it's the right thing to do. That's what he said. I could command you, Philemon, in the name of Jesus. If you respect me as an apostle, I could give you a command in Jesus' name that as a believer you'd need to obey. Wow. Can you imagine a preacher today getting up and telling his congregation that? I don't even need to ask you to put any money in the offering. I could command you in Jesus' name. 
probably be the smallest offering ever given that Sunday. Uh, people say, I'll show you commands. And, uh, but there's something different about those first century apostles. They raised the dead. They healed the sick. Um, they had credibility like no other generation of preachers since. Amazing. And there's been a lot of generations of preachers that had tremendous results and were tremendous men of God and were tremendously respected. But this guy was one of the original, not the original 12, but one of the first century apostles. Greatest evangelist who ever lived. Now, so he said in in verse 7, or verse 8 rather, though I might be much bold of Christ to enjoy in, in, in uh, that which is convenient, uh, He's saying in the New Living Translation, I could demand it in the name of Christ. Verse 9, Yet for love's sake, I rather beseech you, being such in one as Paul the aged, and now also, he goes back to this, a prisoner of Jesus Christ. He thinks he's got a trump card here. He identifies himself that way in verse 1, now in verse 9. He brings that phrase up again. I'm a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Here's how the New Living Translation renders it. But because of our love, I prefer just to ask you. Verse 8, I could demand it in the name of Christ because it's the right thing to do. But because of our love, I prefer to ask you. So take this as a request from your friend Paul. There he's laying one trump card down. You and I have been friends a long time. I'm your friend, Paul. There's a trump card. He said, uh, he said, I beseech you, such one, Paul the aged. Oh, I'm in the New Living Translation. Uh, that's why it wasn't, I couldn't find that phrase again in the King James. But because of our love, I prefer just to ask you. So take this as a request from your friend, Paul, an old man, now in prison for the sake of Christ Jesus. He's laying all this. I'm an old guy. Don't fight with me. I'm your dear friend. And you know good and well, Philemon, I'm locked in a prison, probably on death row, because of my preaching Christ to the lost. So he's laying down all of his trump cards. Now, what does Paul do instead of ordering Philemon? Because they're dear friends, he chooses to ask, but in earnest. He's laid the groundwork, having the authority of an apostle. I could order you to do this. We can't understand that. I can't imagine any preacher saying that anywhere to a church member in America today. We don't see ourselves as dictators. But we're not first century apostles who God gave the authority to keep the doctrine right, no matter what was going on around them. They had to watch over that first century doctrine like hawks, because it was going to be the doctrine that the church would be built on for the centuries that lie ahead. And so God gave them a special authority. But he said, I'd rather ask you. So what does Paul do? Because the dear friends he chooses to ask, but it is in earnest. Philemon to do these things. He, he reminds Philemon that he, Paul is now old, that he's in prison for his preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, we will get to know Paul's pleading uh, with his friend for the sake of the welfare, or we will get to Paul, the word no is not in my note there. We will get to Paul's pleading with his friend for the sake of the welfare of Onesimus next week. So, um, the gold I looked for here was that I, I discovered here that you and I can apply to our lives. A Christian should always strive to do what's right. He said, I could order you to do this, what I'm about to ask you. I could order it because it's the right thing to do. How does that apply to us? Paul hasn't given you and I any of those. I don't know. Thirteen epistles. Paul told me quite a bit of what I should do. 
So what should I do in response of that first century apostle writing 13 epistles? None of them were addressed to me. They were addressed to his readers. But guess what? We are now, as we study the Scripture, among his readers. So Paul had the churches in the province of Galatia in mind when he wrote Galatians. God knew that they wouldn't be the only ones that read this thing. God had you and I in mind. So when Paul is writing these things under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, he's writing them to us. So every time Paul teaches something, it's as if he's saying, I could order you to do it because it's the right thing to do. Paul taught right doctrine. When Paul tells us to forgive, even as we're forgiven, it's the right thing to do. He didn't request it. He told us. And he had the authority to tell us. He said, I could, as an apostle, I could give you an order to do this. Why? What gives me that authority to give you an order? Because by the Holy Spirit, I know it to be the right thing to do. So everything, when we teach and preach our way through Paul's epistles, there's a little bit of gold in an epistle written to a man about his runaway slave. Doesn't have a lot to do with the story in that regard, but it has, a, it has a lot to do with our story. We're still living, we're still learning, and Paul is still teaching.